The mist slowly cleared with the rising sun. Something strange was happening on the shore. The people of Bombay were surprised to see a ship aiming its gun at the gateway of India. Even the iconic Taj Hotel and the Royal Bombay Yacht Club were targeted. These buildings had something in common. They were a symbol of British pride, a symbol of nearly 200 years of colonial oppression in India. What happens next is even more surprising. The residents of Bombay came out to support these attackers. Yes, I'm not kidding. They actually supported them. They bought packets of food to the ships for these soldiers. The battle had to be fought, but there weren't enough troops in Bombay. So the government had to call troops all the way from Sri Lanka to support them. In a few hours, Bombay had become a war zone. Right now you might be asking yourself, who are these attackers? Why are the people supporting them? And how did we not know that Bombay was under attack? World War II had drained the coffers of England. It was getting too expensive to maintain such a huge army. To cut costs, they fired many people, reduced salaries, and working conditions became really bad. The quality of food took a big hit. These changes affected everyone, especially the Indian soldiers. To top it all off, they also had to endure insults from their racist officers. This deeply angered the Indian soldiers. Their anger was like a volcano, a volcano waiting to erupt. On the morning of 18th February 1946, the volcano erupted. In the port of Bombay, on this ship, the HMIS Talwar. The soldiers locked up their British officers and completely took over the ship. They immediately relayed their actions to ships across India. Within hours, the revolt had spread to 60 ships. The sailors removed the British flag and replaced it with flags from the Indian National Congress, Muslim League, and the Communist Party of India. The sailors began calling themselves the Indian National Navy. A committee was elected to lead the rebellion, and they decided that the revolt was going to be peaceful. They came up with a list of demands, 12 in total. On one hand, they had political demands like British nationals should leave India. release of ina prisoners and political prisoners on the other hand they had basic demands like better quality of food equality in status and pay and so on these demands acted as a rallying point for thousands of indian soldiers to join the revolt by the third day 20000 soldiers 78 ships and 20 shore establishments had joined the revolt let us try to understand what's happening here 20000 soldiers who were being paid by the british were now fighting against them and this was a huge blow to the british government to make things worse for the british government the army the air force and even the local police had joined the revolt within 72 hours the british government had lost complete control over its soldiers the british were not prepared for such a revolt and they were completely caught off guard to regain some sort of control they decided to crush the rebellion with brute force it ordered its soldiers to attack the indian national navy but The Indian soldiers of the British army refused to attack their brothers in the navy. Having no other option, British soldiers and ships were ordered to attack the Indian National Navy. The battle went on for hours and things were going fine for the Indian National Navy until British reinforcements from Sri Lanka had arrived. It became very clear to the Indian soldiers that they needed help to fight the British Empire. and they decided to ask for help you are people and are respected political leaders you must support us the indian soldiers hoped that the political leaders would support them in their fight for freedom but the two most influential and important parties at the time the indian national congress and the muslim league refused to support them our leaders like gandhi nehru jinnah asked the people to not support the revolt sardar vallabhbhai patel told the people to go about their work as usual The Muslim League held a protest against the revolt. So, why didn't the leaders support them? Weren't they fighting the British too? These were the same leaders that encouraged Indians to fight for the British during both the world wars. But why didn't they want Indian soldiers to fight against the British? 
This is what our leaders thought. They thought this mutiny would disturb the transfer of power from the British crown to the Indians. So basically they were thinking we've been promised freedom so why bother fighting for it? Now you must be thinking the revolt died down because the leaders didn't support it, right? The volcano that erupted on HMS Talwar was not a faint one. It caused a tsunami, a tsunami whose waves touched the hearts of each and every Indian. What happens next completely changes the revolt. Rumors circulated in the city that the British were going to starve the sailors into submission. The reaction to the rumor was fantastic. We thought that the country had abandoned us to the wolves. People by their actions showed that they could think and act for themselves. They rushed to our rescue. People from all walks of life had gathered around the gateway of India to give food to these soldiers. The British officers were helpless spectators. The people had gone against their political leaders and supported the rebellion in huge numbers. There were demonstrations and strikes across India. In Bombay, nearly 3 lakh people supported the revolt. This was no longer just a navy mutiny. It had become a national movement to finally end British rule in India. The movement was headed by the Communist Party of India, the Hindu Mahasabha and the only Congress leader to support them, Aruna Asaf Ali. The British government was astonished to see the massive public support for the revolt. They immediately ordered a lati charge to keep things under control. But the civilians fought back. They fought back to such an extent that the British government had to use British soldiers and tanks to shoot them. As a result, over 300 people died and thousands were injured. By this time, the Indian National Navy had started negotiating with the government. The British government agreed to some of the demands in principle and also took immediate steps to improve the working conditions of Indian soldiers in the army. Sardar Wallabhai Patel and Maulana Abul Kalam Azad promised the Indian soldiers that they would not be punished by the government for revolting. At the same time, Muhammad Ali Jinnah asked the Muslim sailors to surrender. This sealed the fate of the mutiny and the mutiny came to an abrupt end on 23rd February 1946. After promises made by the government and the national leaders, the revolt finally came to an end on 23rd February, five days after the incident on HMIS Talwar. What followed was betrayal. The betrayal of promises made by the national leaders and the government. The soldiers who took part in the revolt were imprisoned, removed from duty and sent home. The national leaders did nothing to stop this from happening. The British government thought that they had successfully managed to crush the revolt and that the Indian soldier would forever be loyal to them. But that was not the case. In the months following the mutiny, many Indian soldiers refused to listen to their British officers. And this led to many smaller mutinies across India. The British government finally realized that they could no longer control the Indian army. If they couldn't control their own army, how could they expect to rule a country of 360 million people? Let us see what the British had to say about this. Here is a conversation between the then acting governor of Bengal, Mr. P.B. Chakraborty, and Mr. Clement Attlee, the Prime Minister of Britain. Mr. Chakraborty asks, the Quit India movement had tapered off, but why did the British leave India at this time? To which Clement Attlee replies by saying, there were many reasons, the main among them being the military activities of the INA led by Subhash Chandra Bose, the Navy mutiny, which led to the erosion of loyalty to the British Crown among the Indian Army and Navy personnel. This conversation clearly shows that the Navy mutiny was a significant event which led to India's independence. Later on, P. V. Chakraborty goes on to ask, what was the extent of Gandhi's influence upon the British decision to leave India? To which Clement Attlee smiles sarcastically and says, minimal. So why don't more people know about the Navy mutiny? This historic act of bravery and courage has no public memory nor does it find its rightful place in our history textbooks. Is it because some events are more important than others? Are events like civil disobedience or Quit India movement more important than the Navy mutiny? Or is it because this historic act of bravery does not fit into the narrative that India got its independence through non-violence? 
In its last statement, the strike committee concluded, "Our strike has been a historic event in the life of our nation. For the first time, the blood of men in the services and in the streets flowed together in a common cause. We in the services will never forget this. We know also that you, our brothers and sisters, will not forget. Long live our great people. Jai Hind."